Our next speaker is Tato Aalto, the senior graphics programmer from Remedy Entertainment, and he is going to talk about rendering Quantum Break. Welcome, Tato. Thank you. Uh, I have quite a few slides, so let's get started immediately. Uh, so I'm Tatu Aalto, uh, senior graphics programmer at Remedy Entertainment. Uh, you might know Remedy Entertainment from games like Max Payne, Alan Wake, and recently Quantum Break. Uh, Quantum Break was released earlier this year on Xbox One and on PC. Uh, in this presentation, I'm breaking down how frame is drawn in Quantum Break. Uh, this is a high-level overview. I will try, try to avoid going into too much detail, but this is still going to be fairly technical. Uh, fortunately, I have loads of pictures to show. Uh, but let's get started with video first, so that everyone knows what I'm talking about. To end. Yeah, to trust me. For what? Jack, run! Why are you helping me? You're with them. It's more complicated than... Our fate is laid out before us, Jack. Everything that happened to get us here, every sacrifice that was made, they're all a part of this path. Can't be changed. I don't know if we can win this. Serene. I've seen the end of time. Okay, that's Quantum Break. Uh, we are a relatively small team at Remedy building games we like. Uh, as, as a part of creating game, we build our own engine and tools that fit to what we do for, aim for. Uh, we use quite a lot of middleware but rendering is made all in-house, apart from Oculus and Culling. Our rendering engine is light pre-pass, meaning we draw opaque geometry uh, twice. On the first geometry round, we fill everything needed for the lighting. Then we calculate lighting, along with a bunch of screen space lighting techniques. And on the second geometry bus, we combine final material with the lighting. Next, transparent is drawn in three resolutions. And finally, in post, we do motion blur, depth of field, and some other visual effects. <clears throat> now, let's go over the frame in the order we do things. I'm mostly going to be following draw order within a frame, but for some cases, being strict would be confusing. Uh, some techniques are split in such ways that I'm jumping a bit to make uh, this presentation a bit easier to follow. So, the first thing, we start, start off by filling the information of lighting on the GPU. Uh, our frustum and occlusion calling runs on CPU and is powered by Umbra. We use the same calling method for both geometry and lights. On top of the CPU calling, we divide frustum into 3D grid and call lights against grid voxels. The method is called cluster shading. This is data layout for uh, one, one point light in our engine. We pack all the visible point lights into single big buffer every frame. This way, it's possible to easily access everything needed for calculating lighting in any single shader. Uh, code snippet on the left side contains all the properties of the point light that we expose to shader. Some of this is specific to volumetric lighting, and some of it only affects opaque geometry. In addition to this, we pack simplified version for GPU calling. 
these two red buffers contain culling information. Format of these are 16-bit integers. Uh, they contain indices to visible lights. On our cluster shading implementation, every cluster can have 64 intersecting point and spotlights before we run out of indices. On these images, most of the data you see is random that hasn't been filled ever. But uh, on roughly every 64 pixels, there's a bright red end of lights marker for a cluster. Up, after updating lights, uh, we do the same thing for the materials. We store the data for all the materials that are currently loaded into CPU memory. Every material will then have simple integer offset that can be used for reading the data on the GPU. We pack all the shadow and projection maps into a couple of large atlas textures. This is needed in order to access all the data related to lighting in a single shader. <coughs> atlas on top left corner contains projection maps for spotlights. In this scene, we use few masks for street lights and such. And on the left corner of the atlas, you can see a custom texture for a level-specific projection on the university building. Uh, this atlas can also contain video textures. I could, for example, uh, stream my presentation on the projector in game level. Top right atlas contains traditional depth buffer for lights that use percentage closer filtering. Uh, the maps you see in here are from sunlight cascades. Uh, looks like cascade count here has been limited to three on this location. Uh, normally on Xbox One we use five. Uh, PCF Atlas can also contain spotlights that support dynamic occluders. Most of the direct lights in my capture are static point lights. Uh, bottom Atlas uses two-channel 16-bit format in order to support variant shadow maps. As you might see, small cube textures have been flattened to this 2D Atlas. Uh, we pad edges of each face of the cube so that any direction can be fetched with single sample. Some of the regions in here are also spotlights that use variant shadow map filtering. Depending on location, we use either procedural or a hand-painted sky dome. The procedural sky hasn't seen updates since Alan Wake, so almost everything in Quantum Break is uh, hand-painted. Uh, sky you see in this picture is hand painted, and on top right you can see the uh, bottom right you can see the visualization of the cube map we draw based on the sky dome. Here a bit larger view of the cube map. We use this as a base for our ambient lighting. For specular lighting, we simply generate the MIP chain of this cube map. For diffuse lighting, we pick low resolution MIP of the cube and calculate third order, or third order spherical harmonics out of it. These diffuse and specular representations don't obviously contain any occlusion, so we are not using them directly. Uh, I will briefly go over the usage later. At this stage of the frame, we are still updating data for the pre uh, coming up passes. Next, we draw geometry. This is the first pass of geometry. On the first round, we output geometry buffers in four, with 4x MSAA. This data is then converted into normal single sample buffers. Uh, we have more detailed presentation coming on anti-aliasing in Quantum Break in next GDC Europe, so I will not go into details with this stuff. Anyway, the geometry buffer contains normals, material ID, smoothness, and intensity of specular albedo. Uh, depending on material, we also store trans uh, tangent or translucency, not both. All the properties are packed into two 32-bit buffers and later used when calculating lighting and screen space effects for opaque geometry. In addition to previous buffers, we draw velocity of specified moving objects in a separate pass. Static geometry is handled uh, first on full screen pass that outputs velocity based on pixel depth and camera matrix from previous and current frame. After that, we draw moving objects as normal geometry and output pixel velocity, seen as overlay on this picture. This is how the actual velocity buffer looks like. 
this is a bit poor visualization. Uh, negative values have been clamped to black, but you get the idea. <coughs> Based on the previously shown geometry buffers, we calculate screen space ambient occlusion in the same resolution as the lighting. Our Ambient occlusion implementation is based on line sweep algorithm detailed in publication by Ville Timonen. Uh, to put it short, algorithm first builds occlusion, uh, occlusion lookups by sweeping over the depth buffer in lines with few directions. And then on the second pass, it resolves occlusion on single pixel by reading the occlusion lookups around the pixel location. Uh, in reality, there's ob obviously a lot more lines than in my visualization here. After ambient occlusion, we calculate occlusion and color for specular reflection. In this picture, I only have occlusion visualized. Uh, for specular, we again weigh much over the depth buffer in order to find occluding areas on the image. <coughs> Unlike with AO, marching starts from the pixel that we resolve occlusion for. See the blue circle on the left side of the character. Based on the normal and smoothness that have been read from the geometry buffer, we pull reflection direction from GTX distribution and sample eight depth samples from starting location to screen edge. You can check more details of this in our 2015 Seagraph talk. As I mentioned previously, we use cascade shadow maps for the sunlight. Uh, before calculating lighting, we sample shadows in screen space for opaque geometry using interleaved percent disclosure uh, filtering. Most of the geometry uses unified kernel width, but we have some materials that allow adjusting the kernel size. For example, Follits in this picture uses larger kernel for softer shadows. This is in no way physical, but well, it works. Uh, here you can see the final direct lighting. Uh, since we previously packed all the data needed for the lighting into large buffers and textures, we can fill everything in a single full screen pass. As I mentioned earlier when talking about updating light data, per pixel light culling is done in a clustered shading style. While lighting the scene, we also apply ambient and specular occlusion to some of the fill lights that have low resolution or no shadow maps. Applying the screen space information adds small scale detail that would be extremely hard to capture with shadow maps only. Uh, we support three light types, point, spot and directional light, and some variations of those. Our indirect lighting is pre-calculated from static lights and static geometry on server farm. Uh, we first slice the geometry world, uh, game world into three 2D cells. For each cell, we build sparse grid based on static geometry and artist guidance. For the corners of the grid, we path raise visibility from sky and indirect contribution from the static lights placed into level. Again, you can find a lot more details about our global illumination stuff in 2015 Seacraft presentation. And finally, for indirect, you can see a neat prototype where we have added indirect diffuse lighting by sampling screen space information. We didn't actually see with this, this, it came in a bit hot in the end of the production. Still looks very good in many locations like in here. Uh, when screen space ambient occlusion can leave small occluded areas unnaturally dark, adding also diffuse light from screen space can help to bring in lost detail. Reasoning in this is similar to what I mentioned earlier with the shadows. It's extremely hard to capture such detail with pre-computed methods, uh, especially with limited memory budget. After that, we do opaque material. Using the previous lighting information, we can now draw the final opaque geometry. We draw again using Forex MSAA and combine lighting with the final material properties. In quantum break, this mostly means adding the diffuse color that wasn't part of the geometry buffer. For characters, we also add custom light rig here while drawing the geometry. Rig is tuned to work based on the lighting conditions around the character, so it's mostly automatic and doesn't need location-based tuning. <coughs> On 
On top of opaque geometry, we draw decals to add variation and detail. I didn't go through it earlier, but decals are also drawn on top of geometry buffer earlier in the frame. This way, they can have proper effect on lighting also. Look, for instance, the puddles on the ground of, uh, in the picture. Puddle decal makes the surface smoother at the wet location. As a result, point light on the left side of the image starts to reflect intense light from the ground. And now more lighting. Filling the volume light, I'm talking next, happened a bit earlier actually, uh, but it fits better here. Uh, so we will fill all the lights in the scene in the frustum fit volume texture. On Xbox One, size of the volume is 90 times 45 times 64. So this is quite low resolution representation of the lighting in the scene. While the light buffers I showed you earlier contain lighting at opaque surface, this volume texture contains lighting everywhere within a camera volume. In order to understand the picture you see here, think of slices of scene starting from the camera and going further. Uh, these five closest slices on top of the image cover only a few centimeters of space, as that's enough to cover the viewport very close to camera. Then further away, slices get to meters, and you start seeing the character standing in front of the camera. And tens of meters covering larger and larger areas of the scene. Light cones on the middle rows are from two spotlights that are facing down. And this is the final image from the location. You can see the same two spotlights and the character standing close to the camera. Volume texture can be used for fast access to low resolution lighting at any point within the camera frustum. We use this data for lighting particles and driving custom character rig, for example. In addition to just filling the volume with light, we stabilize the light volume by mixing it with results from the previous frame. Similar to previous light volume, we use frustum fit volume textures for filling density of participating media. In this picture, you see combined results of volume density and lighting. Density is driven by ground fog and our normal particle system. On the particle editor, you can simply select the density volume as a target pass. This is a very efficient method for filling large areas with thick smoke, but it can provide sharp detail due to the limited resolution. One big advantage uh, against traditional particles is that the blending between effects just works and no per particle effect sorting is needed. And here around the character you can see roughly what kind of detail you can expect from our global volume lighting. Remember you, this is used everywhere, so not only on this kind of location. Uh, you can see the that the character blocks the lighting in a such way that the participating media doesn't get lit behind him. Anyway, the detailed character's silhouette is still missing, so while it adds the mood to scene, it misses the crisp feeling that you would expect from this kind of picture. As with many, many other aspects of rendering, we again mix different techniques and work on multiple scales. For the cases where we need more detailed volumetric lighting, than our global, global volume can support, we may way march custom shafts into normal transparent target. And this leads us to transparent rendering. <clears throat> uh, we draw transparent geometry in three resolutions in order to avoid heavy fill rate. Artists can either choose to draw resolution manually when setting up the particle system or let the engine automatically drop the resolution when the effect gets closer to camera and would fill more pixels. <coughs> Effects are often set up in such a way that many resolutions are used. For example, when doing large explosion, you might want to draw thick smoke in the volume density or low resolution transparent targets. Smoke easily it's a lot of fill rate. Detail like sparkles and fire can then be added into high resolution targets as they usually fill as pixels. Visual effects in quantum break would really uh, deserve a separate presentation. 
but I'll go quickly over custom system we created for events where the time is breaking down. In this picture, I have disabled effect completely, and the character is just standing in a basic warehouse. On the bottom right corner, you can see a single frame of wave simulation that we feed with inputs from gameplay events. You can think uh, this simulation as a top view where the character is standing in the middle of, of the uh, red ripple. When turning on the geometric, geometric distortion, you can see that the rings in the simulation are located around the player character. Simulation peaks push geometry up in the scene. Here we have applied distortion to base geometry and decals uh, into geometry and decals, both, based on the simulation frame. Next, we add some custom light effects into the scene. This effect is also guided by the simulation, along with some artist-made distortion maps. And on top of lighting, we add particles, again driven by the wave simulation. Here, the particles are spawned from screen space. We run a compute task that reads the simulation texture, depth, and final screen color. Based on these properties and some randomization, we either spawn particle or discard it. When particle gets, gets created, we write its properties to GPU buffer and actually read it back to CPU for simulation. Our depth of field implementation is based on separable bokeh depth of field uh, introduced by DICE in 2011 CGRAPH. We are not doing any additional sp sprite splatting on the high intensity areas, so we have put some time to uh, tuning this separable kernel stable enough to work, work alone. Next, after depth of field, we take earlier shown velocity vectors into use and do motion blur. In addition to opaque geometry, we also draw quite a lot of effects into motion work to target. For example, any particle can be set up uh, set to affect motion vectors, causing directed blur on top of the image. We also have separate displays buffer where particles and other effects can be drawn. Based on the displacement texture, we do full screen pass, where we move pixels based on the requested displacement amount. And after all that is done, we create luminance histogram and adapt exposure automatically. Most of the locations in quantum break clamp exposure range in order to avoid extremes. Automatic behavior is pretty much always used when gameplay is active. In cinematics, we mostly use hand-animated exposure. Flares are drawn after auto-exposure in order to keep the input a bit more stable. On this image, you can see flares being set up on the core lamps. Our flare occlusion is based on GPU queries that are done on top of the depth from opaque surface. Here you can see the MIP map pyramid that we use to create blue. On the large picture, you can see MIP, MIP maps combined uh, for the final effect with intensity tuned up. While do doing the blue, we also add lens texture and final grading using color lookup table. And last part of the scene rendering is temporal anti-aliasing and upscale. We store three previous frames with sub-pixel offset. Store frames are combined into the most recent one to create good-looking and stable images. As I mentioned earlier, we have more details coming on anti-aliasing in GDC Europe in two weeks. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Obviously, it wasn't my effort only. <laughs> I'll throw thanks and say that we are quite few, but we are hiring, especially if you are into graphics, we need one guy. And questions. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Tato. 
Very you. exciting. So any questions? No questions? Everything was crystal clear. I will show trailer if there's no questions. Yeah, I don't think there's no questions, so... There's lots of, lots of time. Yeah. We can use the big, big monitor at least. Big screen, I mean. So, I didn't have any conclusions because it's just rendering a frame, so let's check how the frames look if you haven't seen the quantum break gameplay. The number one killer is time. It destroys us all. When Paul came back, he came back wrong. Older, changed. He took away the only person who could stop the end of time. Will, my brother. Monarch are trying to stop me. Thing is, when time broke and changed Paul, it changed me too. Time's skipping. It's getting stuck, caught in violent loops. It's getting worse. Everyone freezes except me. Monarch has tech to keep going when time breaks. Paul knew this was coming. He's not trying to stop it. Maybe he even made this happen. This could have all been avoided. Well... Will's here, even when he's gone. A puzzle trapped in broken time. The universe is a singularity. There should be no sound, no light. 
glimpses of the first prototype time machine, the origin of time travel. Something went horribly wrong here, but it's scrambled. It's impossible to crack. Come with me. We can survive this together. Give me the device. Don't do it, don't! What if you're wrong? No! Okay, thank you again. So, works? Um, do you use tessellation in the time warp effect, or is it just a vertex displacement based on the uh, effect? Yeah, so field? the question is that if we use uh, GPU tessellation, you probably mean? Yeah. 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 Uh, yes, we do use GPU tessellation uh, on some of the scenes. It's, it's quite slow on consoles, so right. uh, it's very limited, but yes, we do use it for some, some stuff. Okay, and I also had another question. Uh, do you calculate a volumetric uh, light the frost and frost and uh, volume light for every frame. Uh, yes, it's it's updated all the time. Yes, it's okay. actually quite fast updating it. It's uh, like half a millisecond or so. So it's a lot cheaper than than the normal lighting. The resolution is quite small. Right. Okay. Thank you. How is the uh, frame time budget divided. Do you have some very computer intensive passes, for example, or are they? Sorry, what, uh, what was shared? the start of the question? How does the? How is the budget in the frame time divided? Do you have some very heavy f steps in there, for example? Uh, it's roughly so that we have third of the frame is geometry, third of the frame is lighting, and third of the frame is post and and constant stuff. Uh, we don't have any strict limits actually on anything. It's it's really based on on the location. Uh, if you think of outdoor scenes and indoor scenes, they have different characteristics. Usually, if you have night scenes, you're outdoors. You can see hundreds of lights in the one scene, and then if you have sunlight, it's, it doesn't doesn't make much sense adding loads of point, point lights on the field or so on. So it's a bit, it, it varies a bit, but that's the rough dev device we use. Any other questions? No. I guess that's the second thank you then. Yes, <laughs> Thanks. good one. Thank you.